Yom Kippur, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar, October the 6th, 1973. The mood was one of resolute complacency. Our military intelligence was reporting that war was very improbable. But at the Suez Canal, there were signs of intensive Egyptian preparations. It seemed like the people who got our reports uh, were somewhat indifferent. We saw massive um, troop movements uh, moving into positions, infantry along the canal. There was also quite heavy movements of semi-trailers uh, moving into a position west of us that uh, appeared to be a missile site. Everything we reported in over the field telephones, the response was always, oh, we've heard that already. If you, if you hear anything uh, relevant, please talk to us. As the solemn day began, there were intelligence reports saying that Egypt and Syria would attack at 6 p.m. that day. David El Azar, the army chief of staff, suggested an immediate and full mobilization of reserves and a preemptive strike, but Moshe Dayan, the Minister of Defense, overruled him and authorized only a partial call-up. A few minutes before the uh, shells started falling, we were given a very quick warning to go into the uh, shelters that we had. Um, and then, as I remember it now, all hell broke loose. It was like the sky was falling in on us. We were some 21 men all together facing thousands. Their infantry started crossing the canal. One of our officers managed to sink four of them. From the very beginning, the feeling was almost one of hopelessness because we realized how few we were and against how many we had to stand. All of a sudden, we felt that we were actually caught unprepared and something terrible was actually happening. Torn from their families at a moment's notice, men ran to join their units at the front. They let us surrender. On the way to one of their military uh, cars, I believe it was a jeep there where they took us, uh, I saw some of our men. Uh, they were lying in a pile. The Egyptians had evidently gathered them up. Uh, they were dead lying everywhere. It was like a slaughterhouse. During the day, 50 Israeli planes had been lost to sand missiles. We had suffered a terrible blow and our string of supposedly impregnable forts along the Suez Canal were virtually overrun. The unthinkable had happened. We seemed to be facing catastrophic defeat. The succeeding days brought no respite. On October the 9th, in a disastrous counterattack, we lost 250 tanks, most of them victims of the new Soviet anti-tank missiles. By night, another 20,000 Egyptians had crossed and were three miles inland. In northern Israel, the story was similar. Here on the barren heights, a huge Syrian force faced less than 300 of our soldiers and a few tanks. When the Syrians cracked through in two sections, all our northern villages and towns lay exposed. On the home front, everyone was trying to help the war effort. By this time, early complacency had been replaced by shock at our losses. And I shall never forget the pain at seeing, for the first time in my life, Israeli prisoners of war on television. With battles on two fronts, our situation was very grave. In Sinai, the Egyptians were widening their bridgehead across the canal. No Arab forces had ever won such victories against Israel. As if these complications were not enough, we were in very urgent need of arms. 
to replenish our great losses in planes and tanks. It was the first time that we were told that Israel might require resupply while military operations were still going on. In other words, that the war would last longer than anyone had led us to believe. Well, there was no doubt in my mind, no doubt in Henry Kissinger's mind, as to what we should do. Israel had to be saved. Well, there were some in the Defense Department that thought that we could have the airlift, but do it in such a low-key way. First, they uh, were going to have Israeli planes come in, paint off the Star of David, and have them deliver it. And I said, no way you're going to do that. That isn't going to work. It's going to be found out. Uh, so we skipped that one. And finally, I said, it's got to be done by American planes. And I remembered that Henry Kissinger, after negotiating with the Defense Department, he said, we have a plan. We will send three C-5As. And I said, well, three doesn't seem like very many. I said, how many do we have? He said, well, I don't know. I think about 25. I said, send all 25. He said, but the Defense Department people believe that if we send 25, that that's more than the traffic will bear politically. And I said, look, I'll take care of the politics. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get blamed just as much for three as if we send 25. I said, I want you to send everything that can fly. It took us 48 hours. So by Friday evening, the full airlift of the United States was at the service of resupply of Israel. Five days into the war, our condition was better in the north. At one point, our forces had been reduced to six tanks. When they were reinforced by two armored divisions and counterattacked, the results were devastating. In horrendous onslaughts, the Syrians lost nearly a thousand tanks. Their army that had come with pride and lightning now lay smashed and ruined on the Golan Hills, leaving our forces within artillery range of Damascus. But in the south, we were still in peril. On October the 14th, the Egyptian armor attacked towards the Sinai passes. In the half-day inferno of battle, over 300 Egyptian tanks were destroyed. For Israel, the tide was turning. A day later, Israel went on to the attack using a plan devised by General Sharon. Taking advantage of a gap between the Egyptian forces, Israeli commandos now crossed the canal to the western side on rubber boats. Within two days, our forces were 16 miles into Egypt. The objective of the action was to create a major Israeli bridgehead. By the time the Egyptians woke up to what was happening, their forces west of the canal had been decimated. Now, in panic, Sadat and his Soviet backers rushed to consult with Kissinger. Then, on Friday, Brezhnev, invited me to come to Moscow to negotiations on a ceasefire. I had told the Israelis all during that last week that the maximum time we would be able to delay would be 48 hours after there was a formal request for a ceasefire and that they should have their military operations in a shape in which uh, they could implement their judgment. The ceasefire was called for October the 22nd. In the north, Syria had been totally driven out of the Golan Heights. In the south, in spite of the ceasefire call, skirmishes continued till Israel had surrounded the Egyptian Third Army and cut off its supplies. That was when Sadat panicked and asked for a joint United States-Soviet force to police the ceasefire. When Kissinger said no, the Soviet reaction was violent. Their airborne divisions would rescue the surrounding Egyptian army. Then we had a situation where Brezhnev, in a communication, said, in the event that we do not do it together, then the Soviet Union must act alone, unilaterally. We considered that to be a message of the most dangerous implications. And that was why we made the decision and it was a very difficult decision, but one that was very necessary, that we had to get the message back to Brezhnev that we would not tolerate Soviet unilateral intervention in the Mideast area. And we backed it up by calling an alert, which involved even the possibility of nuclear weapons. So calling the alert 
while it was criticized for risking nuclear war, was actually what kept the Soviet Union out and avoided what would have been eventually a nuclear conflict. The Soviets yielded to American pressure and the crisis was quickly resolved. A United Nations Peace Force was sent to supervise the ceasefire. The war had lasted almost three weeks. Its effects were to reverberate for years. The United States emerged with its political position strengthened. But a worldwide Arab oil embargo and a fourfold rise in oil prices showed the new strength of Saudi Arabia and OPEC. Israel had won the war, but there was no mood of celebration. Egypt had lost the war, but it had not been humiliated. For us in Israel, it was a traumatic and unforgettable experience. Israel lived, but 2,000 of our men had died. 3,000 had been wounded. The war had evoked this uh, spirit of sacrifice in our darkest hour. But there were harsh lessons to be learned, harsh military lessons about the fallacies of static defense, emotional and psychological lessons about the dangers of excessive self-confidence. For since 1967, many Israelis had felt that we were in possession of the field. We could dictate the future. Above all, this was a turning point, both in Arab and in Israeli history. We came out of the war with a new sense of vulnerability. They came out of the war with a new sense of honor and pride. The terms of the Arab-Israeli dialogue had changed. After the war, disengagement of forces was the first priority. The Geneva Conference in December seemed to be a first step towards this goal. Andrei Gromyko and Henry Kissinger were the joint chairman. I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Israel, Foreign Minister Abba Eban. There has never been an Arab-Israel peace conference before. Instead, there have been many wars for which the price has been paid in thousands of lives and in a region's long agony. The Geneva Conference was very unlikely to lead to peace treaties. It was called a peace conference, and yet the Egyptian foreign minister refused even to sit next to me in case he was infected by Israeli proximity. The Syrians had even refused to come. And yet I had the feeling that something new had entered our history. The Geneva Conference adopted a motion proposed by Kissinger and Gromyko that Egypt and Israel would appoint military representatives and work out an urgent disengagement agreement. The joint aim of Secretary Kissinger and myself was to give the Soviet Union as much responsibility and as uh, little influence as possible. When I first came to Syria, the Syrian president said, I will not be here this country to sign a peace treaty with Israel, no matter what conditions you bring us. Sadat was the one who best understood that a new psychological climate had to be created. But even he had to go through stages before he could take the final lead. Sadat was in the wholesale business and Assad was in the retail business. Uh, Sadat focused on the fundamental objective and then wanted to get to it very rapidly. And of course, his mind was cleared by the reality that the third Egyptian army was trapped until an agreement was made. So a combination of strategic factors and Sadat's personality brought about a rapid conclusion in the Sinai. In Israel, views were mixed. Many protesters misrepresented Kissinger as weakening our situation on the Golan Heights. Secretary Kissinger had to fly dozens of times to Damascus and then back to Israel to tell me of the Syrian positions, but in the end, agreement was reached. When I first started dealing with the Israelis, Aubrey Eban said to me once, you have to remember that we Israelis consider objectivity to be 100% agreement with our point of view. Until I met Golda Meir, I thought that was a joke. 
but it turned out to be real. On one occasion, she had 11 demands. I got 10 of them. And then she asked Iban, why has Henry betrayed us again? Because I got only 10 out of 11 of her proposals accepted. What Kissinger had accomplished with President Nixon's authority was to help us move away from what would have been an inevitable resumption of the war. Quiet returned to the Golan Heights, and the Egyptians could reopen the canal. The elections held in Israel soon after the war returned Labour once more to power, but the impression of normalcy was only an illusion. On April the 2nd, 1974, a state report shocked the nation. The Angranat report revealed the defence blunders of the first days of the war and the flaws in the assessment of our military intelligence. It was a hard blow to the country's self-confidence. As a result, Chief of Staff David El Azar resigned, as did Prime Minister Golda Meir some time later. I worked very closely with Golda Meir. Her qualities were a passionate identification with the national cause, strength, tenacity, and a great power of defiance. On the other side, her approach to the outside world was apprehensive. She was skeptical about peace prospects, and I always found that she did not react favorably to good news. What most infuriated the public was the Commission's deference to the politicians and its failure to criticize Moshe Dayan, who, as Minister of Defense, bore prime responsibility for our lack of preparation before the war. Yitzhak Rabin, our new Prime Minister, had shared many of Dayan's euphoric views of our military strength, but he had not had any operative responsibility. He was now chosen as a compromise candidate as leader of a divided Labour Party. Owing to differences with the Prime Minister, I didn't join the new cabinet, but I continued to be very, very actively involved in security affairs when I became chairman of the Knesset Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defense, to which the Prime Minister and the Minister of Defense report week by week. In 1977, elections were held, and Israel was presented with a Likud government and a new Prime Minister, Menachem Begin. This result marked a revolution in the direction the country was to take in the coming years. For the first time since I had joined the Knesset, I was to be a member of the opposition. The Labour vote had fallen by almost half. There had been major splits in the party and public discontent with party scandals. The defeat of the Labour Party also marked the discontent of many immigrants from Arab countries with their poor economic position and with what they saw as an attitude of neglect shown to them in the past by the party then in power. Menachem Begin, the country's new leader, had been waiting in the wings for 30 years. Now his moment had come. Above everything else, Begin's obsession was with the enlarged land of Israel. His election manifesto had stated clearly, the right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel is eternal and inalienable. Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, shall not be given up to foreign rule. On the human level, I, along with many Israelis, felt that it was wrong that what seemed to be emerging in the territories was one law for Jews and a more rigorous one for Arabs. The most difficult thing for me during the occupation was to be considered a stranger in my own country. I'm considered a resident, not a citizen. And by this, I don't have any rights associated to my land, property, or future. Could there ever be peace between Arab and Israeli? It seemed doubtful after the war, but in the next few days one began to hear rumors of secret meetings between the Israeli foreign minister Moshe Dayan and a high Egyptian official. Slowly the ground was being prepared for the most sensational scenario of the 1970s, one of those events which changed the course of Middle Eastern history. In November 1977, President Sadat of Egypt breaking all precedents and shocking the Arab world, journeyed to Israel and shook the hands of his arch enemies. Sadat's unbelievable arrival transformed the whole political scene for us. Later, Sadat addressed the Knesset.
we must remove the psychological barriers of suspicion, fear and rejection that have for so long stood between Israel and its neighbors. Suddenly we felt a new page in history was being written. After lengthy discussions, a final press conference was held in the Jerusalem theater. No more war, no more bloodshed, no more attacks, and collaboration in order to uh, avoid any event which may lead to such tragic developments. Let us agree that whatever happens between us, we should solve it together through, uh, 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 I mean, talks rather than uh, going to war. In December, Begin and his ministers visited Egypt and political and military committees were set up to advance the peace process. But the atmosphere was tense. For Egypt, nothing would satisfy it other than our total abandonment of Sinai and a new deal for the Palestinians. Many Israelis believed that too many sacrifices were being asked, too many concessions sought. Amid all this stalemate and recrimination, all of us were stunned when, in August 1977, President Carter dropped his bombshell. One weekend, we were at Camp David. My wife and I were walking in the beautiful countryside there on the mountain. And she said it would be great if we could bring the Israelis and the Egyptians here in this quiet setting without the news media, and uh, maybe they would uh, make some progress. So after consulting with uh, other officials, the Secretary of State and so forth, uh, most of whom discouraged me, uh, I decided to extend the invitation. Here for the first time there was a president of the United States willing to put the presidency really on the line at a hazard in order to attempt a direct personal mediation in an international dispute. Something unique, I believe, in the history of the American presidency. The Camp David meetings opened on September the 5th and were to last 13 days. President Sadat made it clear to me that there were two prerequisites on which he would insist. One was that there be a removal of Israeli settlers from Egyptian territory, and the other that there be a comprehensive enough settlement to include the Palestinian issue. This request to give up the Sinai settlements was, of course, one of the major stumbling blocks. Another major issue was the huge airfields that we had built in Sinai. These would have to be abandoned if we wanted a peace treaty. Finally, Israel was called upon to abandon the Sinai oil wells and to find substitute sources. Prime Minister Begin and President Sadat were totally incompatible. After the third day, it was mutually decided that they would not ever see each other again. And I would go back and forth either between them or with their subordinates to try to negotiate differences. And there were times of total despair on the part of both sides. <laughs> when Prime Minister Begin offered to leave Camp David, and uh, on one occasion, when, when President Sadat actually packed his bags after meeting with Moshe Dayan, uh, who imparted the uh, impression that the Israelis were totally intransigent and would not negotiate any further. And it was only my own visit to President Sadat's cottage that induced him on a personal basis to stay at Camp David. After 13 intense days, Agreement was concluded on Sunday, September the 17th. It provides for the full exercise of Egyptian sovereignty over the Sinai. It calls for the full withdrawal of Israeli forces from the Sinai. And after an interim withdrawal, which will be accomplished very quickly, the establishment of normal, peaceful relations between the two countries, including diplomatic relations. Camp David was a framework. It was not the final thing. We had to discuss the actual withdrawal from the sign. What are the stages, settlements? How are we going to do that? We had to decide on forces by the Egyptians to be kept, yes or no, in the sign. It became obvious to me as we began our negotiations that Prime Minister Begin and his associates had changed their mind about some of the issues that we had decided at Camp David. And so the situation went downhill. And uh, about six months later, in desperation, really, 
I decided to uh, go to Jerusalem and meet not only with Prime Minister Begin, but also the entire cabinet and even some of the uh, committees in the Knesset. We must make this beginning. We must seize this precious opportunity. The people of the two nations are ready now for peace. When I saw President Carter in the Knesset, even his promise to strengthen economic and military relations with us failed to assuage the prophecies of doom. Instead, the Knesset session ended in arguments with those opposed to the treaty. Days of discussion ended in disagreement. There wasn't any real political uh, courage required to go to Camp David. I didn't have much to lose. But uh, it was a, a somewhat uh, dangerous thing for me to risk the prestige of the White House to go on this mission, not having any idea what the outcome might be. Eventually, shortly before I left Jerusalem, thinking I was going to fail totally, uh, Prime Minister Begin and I had a breakfast meeting in the King David Hotel, and we reached basically an agreement, which, for which I was very thankful. The last missing piece was the reaction of Sadat. This necessitated a return to Cairo, which the president had visited only a few days before. I want to express my deep thanks to President Sadat and to the people of Egypt for a welcome that has been exhilarating to me and which I will never forget. In less than an hour, Sadat agreed about oil, about ambassadors, and about the other difficult points. On March the 26th, 1979, a formal peace treaty was finally signed in Washington between Israel and Egypt. To me, it was a tremendous thing to observe the president of the world's greatest country giving so much of his time, will, and perseverance to achieve peace. Each party, Bacon and Sadat, could accept from a third party what neither of them could accept from each other. And therefore, it was a triumphant exercise in mediation, one of the great landmarks, of course, in, in um, Middle Eastern history. After the ceremonies, the first steps were taken to put the peace treaty into action. The start would be a partial Israeli withdrawal from Sinai to be completed in three years. While most Israelis welcomed the peace treaty, for some it meant a dislocation of their lives. This was particularly true for the settlers of Yamit, an Israeli town built in Sinai in the late 60s where the settlers refused to leave peaceably. The Yamit settlers represented the minority. In contrast, most of the country understood that the gain from the peace treaty far overshadowed the price that was being paid. If there are watersheds and dramatic turning points in history, then clearly the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty was one of them. Instead of thousands of Israeli soldiers being killed under a Sinai occupation, Israeli lives would now be spared. Instead of the inevitability of war, as long as we clung to Sinai, war would become inconceivable, particularly with the United States monitoring inspections that had been agreed. The withdrawal took three years, but by April 1982, all of Sinai was in Egyptian hands. President Anwar Sadat of Egypt will not live to see the full implementation of the peace treaty with Israel he had so bravely signed. Yesterday, Arab fundamentalists assassinated him as he viewed the October parade. The opposition was the leftist movement, who were again any peace uh, with Israel. Then you have a fundamentalist opposition, which uh, was based on religious ground. You cannot coexist with a Jewish state. One of the issues constantly before us was how to react to frequent and constant terrorist acts.
history of the uh, relations between the Arabs and Israel during the past uh, 40 years since the establishment of the state has been a uh, history of uh, violence and uh, atrocities and terrorism from the uh, Arab side. In June 1976, an Air France jet carrying many Jews and Israelis was hijacked by Palestinian gunmen to Entebbe in Uganda. Carrying an elite commando unit, four of our aircraft flew secretly to Entebbe to attempt a rescue. There was terrible noise around us. And I think it was two or three minutes, that's what they say, but it seems to me, to me eternity of shooting over our heads. And somebody among us said, look, there are Israeli soldiers here. There was an Israeli soldier talking very quietly. I came to take you home. It's, if you would say that an angel stood in front of me, with, with wings, it was just the same. The next moment that I remember was landing and the door was wide open and I saw such a big crowd. It's unbelievable. I think all Israel was at the airport. We've always been threatened by our Arab neighbors to be thrown into the sea. Uh, we cannot treat it as an empty threat. Extremist activities outside Israel have escalated to holy war and hostage taking. Including Gaza and the West Bank, over a million Arabs fell under Israeli rule as a result of the 67 war. The Yom Kippur War made them less submissive, more inclined to assert their identity. In 1973, that uh, super power mentality towards Israel was shattered. We uh, saw that Israel could and may lose a war. In the mid-70s, the Arab world recognized the PLO as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian Arabs. But the major triumph for their leader, Yasser Arafat, came when the United Nations General Assembly proclaimed that Zionism is a form of racism. The United States rises to declare before the General Assembly of the United Nations and before the world that it does not acknowledge, it will not abide by, it will never acquiesce in this infamous act. Mr. President, for us, the Jewish people, this is no more than a piece of paper and we shall treat it as such. Thank you, Mr. President. It took more than a decade for the United Nations in 1991 to repeal what I had called its most obscene resolution. But looking back, what was very clear at that time was that the entire framework, the whole shape of the dialogue had changed. It was no longer little Israel against the vast, huge, rich Arab world. It was now a powerful, dominant Israel against the poor, dispossessed Palestinians. Without any change in any material reality, we were no longer David, but Goliath. While the world focused on the Palestinians, the prospect of a nuclear Iraq under Saddam Hussein looked extremely ominous for us. Eventually, in 1981, to avoid the danger of Iraq becoming a nuclear power, our Air Force bombed the Osiris nuclear reactor. The rest of the world condemned the attack, calling our fears exaggerated. Despite all the condemnations which were heaped, on Israel, for the last 24 hours, Israel has nothing to apologize for. Meanwhile, inside Israel, terrorist attacks were on the increase in towns, villages, kibbutzim, and schools. Most of them were ordered by the PLO. Since their expulsion from Jordan, the PLO had moved into southern Lebanon, using the area for constant attacks on us until 1981. There had been an effective ceasefire for a year, but Defense Minister Sharon was not impressed by this. We always regarded the terrorist activities by the PLO as the main threat to the peace. 
In 1982, Ariel Sharon had become Minister of Defence. Under Begin, Sharon, an impulsive, charismatic but divisive man, would direct a major war against the PLO, but the Lebanese would be the main victims. On June the 6th, 1982, there was an attempt to assassinate our London ambassador, Shlomo Argov. Israeli forces invaded Lebanon. The initial object was a 25-mile drive into Lebanon to expel the PLO. But there were difficulties, and the war in Lebanon did not go easily. I supported the limited idea of pushing the PLO back from our villages, but with others, I began to suspect that Sharon had his own agenda for setting up a Christian Lebanese government, and this was totally different from the limited security aims of the war. By mid-June, the PLO had been driven out of southern Lebanon and had regrouped in Beirut. The siege of Beirut lasted three months. The effect on Israel's international image was devastating, but so too was the effect on Israel itself. This was the only Israeli war without the support of a national consensus. This was a war that had become highly politicized rejected not only by masses of Israelis, but by many of the soldiers themselves. By mid-August, a PLO retreat was negotiated and 14,000 PLO fighters left Beirut. Israel's elation was brief. In September, Israel's main Lebanese ally, President Bashir Jemayel, was assassinated. Days later, the world was shocked to hear of the massacres at Sabra and Shatila refugee camps. Although the killing was done by Christian Falange troops, part of the responsibility was Israel's, whose commanders held overall control of the area. No such explosion of public outrage had ever been seen before in Israel. But as vehement as were the opinions of the peace camp, the passions of Israelis supporting the government's actions was equally strong. No peace treaty was ever effected between Israel and Lebanon. When the Israeli forces left, what remained as before was chaos and anarchy, bloodshed and civil war. Nobody who had listened to Prime Minister Begin's limited formulation of war aims could possibly have imagined that by the end of it, hundreds of Israeli soldiers would have been killed, thousands of civilians would have lost their lives, that there would be a mark of interrogation on the very future of the Egyptian-Israeli treaty, that Israel itself would be caught up in an unprecedented moral torment, and that the United States, both its government and people, would be alienated. The fact that, that uh, Jordan and the Palestinians uh, rejected participation in the Camp David Accords, in my opinion, was a very serious mistake uh, for the Palestinian uh, community and for the Arab world. The PLO was impossible. And I don't know any Israeli that was ready at the time to start with the PLO end. So we have had to start with the Jordanian end. I knew that the Jordanian king is serious and willing to make peace. I knew also that we are going to bring an end to the war in Lebanon, which will greatly improve our relations with Egypt and create a chance to renew our contacts with the king. And that's what really happened. We have found the readiness on the part of the Hashemite kingdom to take over in balance and together the Jordanian-Palestinian problem and to handle it properly. Uh, namely, to refer to the autonomy on the West Bank, as it was mentioned in Camp David, to settle the outstanding issues between Jordan and ourselves, and to do it under the leadership of the king. The king felt at that time certain that, they can, that he can lead such a drive, and he was ready to do so. The condition was that this will not be neither a Jordanian document nor an Israeli document but this will emerge or appear as an American document. The Americans were all the time in the picture. Not only did they agree to do so, but they have encouraged both sides to reach an agreement. When it was finalized, uh, the Secretary of State of the United States, uh, Mr. Schultz, 
supposed to arrive at the region, handing over in this uh, agreement or this suggestion as an American proposal. On the last minute, Mr. Shamir, who was in the know, who was informed about every move, contrary to all the stories, who knew about the document, who read it, sent over Mr. Arns, who was the minister in his cabinet, without my knowledge, to Schulz, and told him in so many words that his arrival to Israel will be considered as an intervention in the domestic affairs of our country. And so he cancelled his visit to Israel and a great opportunity was lost. I think we wouldn't have the Intifada. I think we would have an earlier peace. I think that today the whole position would be totally different. The one question that would not go away, how to deal with Palestinian nationalism. The Intifada, the Palestinian uprising, which broke out in December 1987, was an attempt by Palestinians to bring change from within. The magic of the Antifada was that people managed to create hope out of desperation. And that's how the Antifada started giving Palestinians the feeling of regained dignity, pride, and started feeling as equals and people who can stand, talk, and negotiate. For the first time after the Antifada started, I started seeing people with smiles on their faces and doing the victory sign, you know. This was only one side of the Intifada. There was another side which united all Israelis in angry resistance. In mid-1989, 16 people died when an Arab forced a bus into a ravine near Jerusalem. This horrific action and a thousand other incidents, including stabbing, car bombings and arson, was changing the whole of the Israeli climate. In recent times, over an 18-month period, and in addition to the Intifada uprising, Israelis have had to endure terrorist attacks against civilians, including more than 2,000 bombs and Molotov cocktails, nearly 100 stabbings, and about 1,000 cases of arson, all the work of Arab activists. Israelis regarded the Intifada as a threat, not to the existence of our state, but to Israelis as individuals. For years, Israel had always managed to accommodate the differences between the secular Jews and the religious Jews. Now, suddenly, the religious parties held the pivotal votes, and they were able to exert an influence disproportionate to their modest size. But what they wanted to do was to impose religious norms on an Israeli society by legislation against the wishes of the majority. But what could not be gained by law was sought increasingly by intimidation. There were attacks by the extreme orthodox on archaeologists whose work was seen as disrespect of the dead. It isn't simply a question of the degree to which Israel should be religious or by whom that should be determined. It's a question of basic human rights. It's a question of Israel's very capacity to present itself to the world and to itself as a humanistic Jewish democracy. Under Begin's lead, the die was cast. West Bank settlement would grow and be encouraged, despite inevitable conflict with the rest of the world. A part of the fervor came from Likud, a part from new minority movements like Gush Emunim, the Bloc of the Faithful. For Gush Emunim, for us, the main thrust behind settling the land of Israel was the fact that it was promised to us in the Bible, whether or not it gave security to the state of Israel, whether or not it provided us with a feeling of comfort, was something that was very secondary. <laughs> In 1991, the Arab-Israeli conflict was overshadowed by cosmic events. Saddam Hussein, the ruler of Iraq, led his country into the brutal conquest of Kuwait. President Bush assembled a coalition of 500,000 American and Allied troops in Saudi Arabia. The aim? To liberate a small country from aggressive conquest. The war was waged with approval by the United Nations. Could this mean a new international order? Israel was not an official belligerent, but it had very much to lose by Allied defeat 
and very much to gain from Allied victory. Israel prepared. Fear is rising that Iraq may resort to the use of bacteriological and nuclear weapons. Night after night we sat in sealed rooms while Iraqi Scud missiles descended on us, sometimes with loss of lives and homes. But there were positive effects. Israel's enemies were weakened. Iraq was weakened by physical destruction. Syria was weakened strategically. The Soviet Union was no longer Assad's ally. Now, instead of the situation being hopeless, at least it is somewhat hopeful because there's some new factors. First, the Soviet Union, which has played the spoiler's role in Mideast conflicts over the years, now will no longer play that role. That does not mean it'll be particularly helpful, but the Soviet Union has such massive internal problems that they cannot afford now to support losers in the Mideast. Arafat uh, has been uh, discredited as the leader of the Palestinians, and more responsible Palestinians, we would hope, would participate in the process. The Saudis, who have always played both sides, and of course have been anti-Israel uh, because of religious reasons or whatever, start playing a more benign role than they have previously. It serves Israel's interest, uh, and not just the interest of others as well, uh, to work out a peaceful settlement, to do it at a time uh, when Israel is strong rather than waiting until later when the strength of their neighbors makes it necessary for them to do so. The state of Israel is one of the miracles of our time. I remember the excitement when it was founded in 1948, and I remember well my visits there. Who can fail to be impressed, amazed even, by all that has been accomplished? And I'm proud of the peace process launched in Madrid in October of 1991. In the aftermath of the Gulf War, we saw an opportunity and we seized it. And now for the first time, Israel is meeting face to face with all of its Arab neighbors. We seek peace, real peace. And by real peace, I mean treaties, security, diplomatic relations, economic relations. When I look out at the world, Israel stands at the front of the line of our real friends. This is a strong, dynamic, productive relationship. And as I said at uh, Kenny Bunkport with Prime Minister Rabin standing by my side, a relationship built to endure. We had a very good meeting. Uh, I was uh, immensely interested in having the opportunity to, to meet with the Prime Minister and to, to ask questions and to listen. I did uh, reassure him on uh, some important points that I would like to restate. First of all, that uh, I am fully committed to maintaining the important relationship we have with Israel. And I understand the continuing strategic importance of Israel to the United States and our commitment to the continuing security interests of Israel. In the early years, my memory of the country had been one of small villages, quiet communities, and a certain folksiness, a provincial country of rough edges and simple songs. By the early 80s, modernity had arrived in fury. Styles, fans, popular culture, everything was shifting. But more important perhaps than architecture, industry and our national style was the fact that the Israeli population itself was changing. In 10 years, over 200,000 chose to leave Israel and live abroad but some came to take their place. Throughout the 70s, there was a steady trickle of Russian newcomers, mostly refuseniks, people who had fought the Soviet system for years. But in the last years of the 80s, 
With Gorbachev's new policy of perestroika, the trickle turned into a vast tide of immigration, a process that would radically transform the face of Israel. Much smaller, but just as moving in its own way, was the immigration of the Jews of Ethiopia. A few had come to Israel in the 60s. Thousands were to come in the 80s. But nothing was to match the 24 hours in May 1991 when 14,000 Ethiopian Jews fleeing the civil war arrived in Israel in one day. Theirs was a hard absorption into a totally different culture but also an absorption with the most profound historic and emotional overtones. I was born 70 years ago in Jerusalem. When I was born, the Jewish population in, under the British mandate of Palestine was 150,000. Today, we have a strong state, four million Jews, one million Israeli citizens that are not Jewish. Who could believe that 70 years such a dramatic historic achievement could be brought into being. I would not say that uh, there were not mistakes, that there were no failures, but if you look at the total sum, I believe that many of us in 1948 when we fought for the independence of the state, couldn't believe that 44 years later, there would be Israel that can defend itself by itself, that no tragedies could happen to the Jewish people in, in the state of Israel. And whenever there is a Jewish community in state of emergency or urgency, like in the Soviet Union, like in Ethiopia. There will be a Jewish force, a Jewish place, a Jewish state that can save them. And so we say to the generations that will come after us, we have entrusted a new creation to your hands. The past inspires, but it is the future that beckons there is a new dawn in Israel, a new tomorrow waiting to be born.